Generating traffic and sales can be a challenge for online merchants. But selling on the Walmart marketplace puts your products in front of millions of customers who shop on walmart.com. And right now, sellers who join Walmart Marketplace can save up to 50% on referral and fulfillment fees for the first 90 days. So get started today. Head over to marketplace.walmart.com slash savings. That's marketplace.walmart.com slash savings. Welcome to E-Commerce Conversations, a podcast by Practical E-Commerce. Welcome to E-Commerce Conversations by Practical E-Commerce. My name is Pamela Hazelton. The new General Data Protection Regulation by the European Union, also known as the GDPR, takes effect on May 25th, 2018. The law is sweeping and it carries massive fines for non-compliance. It also affects most every company worldwide, but it's confusing. There's no better authority in the U.S. to explain the GDPR than John DiGiacomo. He's a partner in Revision Legal, a Michigan-based internet law firm. First, Sean, I would love if you would tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure. My, so my name is John DiGiacomo. I am an attorney with Revision Legal. I am the founding partner of that law firm. Um, we've been in the internet law space since 2012. We represent clients ranging from publicly traded companies to even initial stage startups. So we have quite a diverse uh, client base. Our practice focus, focuses mostly on internet or technology-based companies. And it's a, it's a fairly litigation heavy practice. So a lot of um, what I do on a daily basis is federal court or state court litigation. Um, we have also attorneys that handle patent work, um, trademark registration, and other transactional matters. So do you actually deal with a number of online stores? Yes, we do. We, we deal with a lot of e-commerce companies. We've been fortunate enough to represent um, several e-commerce brokers. Uh, actually, the largest broker in the e-commerce space is one of our clients. We've been very fortunate to work with them. So we see a lot of e-commerce deals, um, both from the seller and buyer side, but also from the broker side. So we have had about every terrible scenario happen you could possibly imagine <laughs> over the course of our uh, a short law firm existence. Um, so we have a lot of experience within e-commerce and with uh, entrepreneurs who are operating within that space. The big thing now is a lot of the smaller e-commerce sites, um, a lot of these business owners tend to kind of procrastinate on things because they're typically one to 20 men shops and they don't have a full IT staff to take care of everything. So they're just now starting to get tons and tons of emails about the general data protection regulation, both from companies like Google and GoDaddy, but then also from companies trying to sell them services. So we want to try to simplify everything so that these uh, store owners and managers understand what all of this is. Could you tell us in layman's terms, what is the GDPR? Sure. Well, the GDPR is kind of a, a second uh, attempt at creating a European-wide data protection policy. Uh, back in 1995, the European Union, uh, which is in some ways farther ahead of us, uh, the United States on this issue, established the EU Data Protection Directive. And that was a directive that was created to kind of normalize the way that data processing was handled across the European Union. Uh, the problem with the Data Protection Directive was that it was a directive. And what that means, if, if you're not a, kind of a nerd on EU policy as I am, um, is that it was not really a regulation. It was a document that defined concepts that then subsequently had to be implemented by European Union member states. So what happened is when the EU member states ultimately created their own regulations underneath the Data Protection Directive, there was kind of a, a patchwork of regulation that a company would have to deal with within the European Union. So in May of 2016, 
the EU Data Protection Directive, the current GDRP, or excuse me, the current GDRP was discussed and then released. And this time, the GDPR is basically a regulation. It's, it's no longer a directive. So the purpose, like I said, of the GDPR is to kind of normalize the data protection law of the European Union and to make the compliance with that law a little bit easier for individuals uh, within the member states. The scope of the data protection uh, law now extends further, however, and extends not only to businesses located within the European Union, but also now to any businesses outside of the European Union which are uh, processing or collecting uh, personal information from European residents. So it's a bit broader, which is why this is now becoming an issue and why you see companies like Google sending these email alerts. What if a business doesn't ship to or accept orders from those countries? Is this something they need to be concerned about? It is. So the GDPR applies to really any business that collects information on or monitors any activity for any person living in the European Union. So, it, for example, if your website tracks the activity of any individual located in the EU, whether through cookies or beacons, uh, or if these individuals are signing up for a newsletter, then arguably you fall under the ambit of the GDPR. So, it, if and that's a t difficult thing to do because if you kind of have a website that's open to anyone, chances are you probably are going to be subject to the GDPR because you are simply keeping your website open to anyone. So it becomes a, a major compliance issue for people uh, who own businesses within the United States. So to understand the true importance here, the only way you could not be affected by the GDPR is to essentially block everyone coming from those types of connections. Would that be correct? That would be, yes, arguably that would be correct, which seems like an almost impossible task. The reality is probably something in the middle. It's probably more like um, you do not intentionally target European residents. It's, it'll be interesting to see how this plays out. And as of right now, all we have is really the regulation itself. We don't have any um, interpreting statutes or case law, and it's not fully been implemented by the member states. That will occur in, in May of 2018. Um, so right now, we really don't know what the answer to that is. But as of right now, based on the, the regulation as it is written, it appears that uh, simply blocking European residents would be the only way to avoid um, the scope of this kind of wide-reaching law. Okay, so we're getting all of these emails from Google and GoDaddy and Microsoft, and, you know, they're all telling us, they're ready, they're up to date for the GDPR, but there must be other providers that, you know, these e-commerce sites are, are using. Are there questions they should be asking these other providers? Are there other things they should be concerned about? Yeah, so there are a number of kind of pain points that I see. Uh, for e-commerce providers, some places might be uh, CDN, so content delivery networks. They could be upstream providers who are providing hosting services for um, any type of data that you're using. The real key one is the uh, customer relations management software. A lot of companies are saying that they're compliant, but when you really dig into what is going on in their CRM, they really aren't. Uh, some of the places where they might face risk due to a lack of compliance are things like targeting European residents who prior to the implementation of GDPR provided consent but now are subject to the GDPR, and maybe that consent is no longer relevant because their opt-in was not provided in an explicit manner. So there are a lot of kind of uh, very complex issues that we are seeing uh, where data must be analyzed and segmented to remove the potentially questionable data to ensure compliance with GDPR. So though a lot of companies are now saying that they are compliant, um, I am skeptical that they are as compliant as that they believe they are. And based on what we are seeing within our own analysis of our own clients, um, a lot of these companies actually aren't as compliant as they say they are. John, that raises two um, pretty important questions here. Are you saying that 
let's say I run a mailing list and I do it through, you know, uh, MailChimp or Constant Contact, and I have people on that mailing list, and some of them are from the the countries that fall under the GDPR. Are you saying that if somebody signed up for my mailing list a year ago, before this was put into place, that it's my job to reconnect with them and make sure that they still want to be on the mailing list? It's not only your job to reconnect with them, but the data that you currently have may not be GDPR compliant. Data that is collected under the GDPR has to be uh, proportional, meaning that it has to be only used for the specific purposes for which it was collected. And then not only that, it also uh, has to be stored for only so long as necessary. So if the use case that was conveyed to this user that signed up, let's say, for example, to your mailing list is now over, then the continued collection and use of that data may be in violation of GDPR. Even beyond that, the consent uh, that was previously given may no longer be effective under the GDPR. Under the GDPR, consent has to be given freely. Uh, specifically, it has to be informed consent, and it has to be unambiguous. And what that really means is that it just needs to be uh, provided to the user in clear and plain language and cannot be hidden. So in the past, when somebody would submit, let's say, a lead form to a website, it was enough within the terms of use agreement to say, by submitting to our website, you agree to the terms that um, you know we provided and you agree to our privacy policy that says that we can collect and use your email for marketing purposes. Well, that's no longer the case, and it's no longer acceptable under the, under the GDPR. So if there are uh, some emails of European residents that you've previously collected in that manner, yes, certainly there would be a compliance risk associated with continuing to use those emails, continuing to store that data, and continuing to process that data um, after the implementation of the GDPR. Now, does this mean we should be going back to doing the double opt-in, or is just that informed consent on the screen where they fill out the form to sign up, is that sufficient? So it really depends on the type of data that's being collected. Informed consent typically has to be very clear and very plain. So what that means currently, we're not sure. Uh, but for, for the perspective of how we're consulting our clients, um, we're saying don't, don't take any chances. Make, basically, make sure that the consent is easy to read. Make sure that when the consent is presented that the user who is consenting knows what they're consenting to and to the use case that they're consenting to. Um, so, for example, if they're signing up for an email newsletter, the consent should say something like, you are signing up for an email newsletter, you agree, and you know that you are doing this. Uh, this will be stored. Your email will be stored for this purpose. We will continue to, to target you. And then the consent also has to have um, references to the rights of the individual. So under the GDPR, there are data subject rights. And among those rights are things like a right to receive a copy of their personal data, a right to uh, confirmation as to whether their data is being processed, a right to understand how their data is being used, uh, a right of erasure of data in, in some circumstances. So the consent really needs to uh, outline those rights as well. It needs to be explicit and it needs to explain that we're collecting this from you. If you want to know how we're doing it or if you, um, you, know, you want us to not do it, you need to let us know. Here's how you let us know. Um, and that all of that needs to be very upfront and very clear, which makes kind of the, the marketing practices that we've used in the past um, a lot more difficult, certainly. Well, I'm wondering, um, and just to clarify, if you say, hey, we're going to use this for marketing purposes, and obviously you need to define what type of marketing purposes, because let's be honest, <laughs> marketing purposes can mean anything. Can I? Can we still link to that information or are you advising that we have, you know, a full-on one or two-paragraph description on the sign-up form? There Can we needs still to be do a full, like a – Yeah, it has to be on the sign-up form. It, it, it has to be – we are advising clients that it must be that explicit. It is not enough to do what we did historically, which would be to use a um, – kind of a terms of use agreement where you would scroll down and click an I agree. Uh, that would not be enough mm -hmm. now. And also – 
using a browser app, uh, which is what we've done in the past as well, where it's simply in the terms of use agreement, and as you browse the site, you assent to that agreement. That is no longer a permitted uh, method of gathering consent either. Pardon my pause there, because this is growing to, into something much, much uh, larger than what a lot of these uh, store owners are, are being told, because, you know, a lot of the emails they're getting from companies uh, they're really trying to make them feel at ease, uh, which makes it ridiculously easy to just kind of say, oh, I'm not worried about it because I use this company and they got everything covered and I use this company. But it sounds to me like a lot of these third-party tools people are using um, are probably not all going to be up to date. I mean, when you go to a website and uh, heat mapping or – uh, click mapping or ones that are just, uh, you know, the swipe in after you've been to the page for a couple of minutes. Hey, what do you think? Do you want to sign up and get our alerts? I mean, th those tools are already collecting some sort of information in advance, even if it's just standard visitor information on they've been on this page for this long. But if they're going to target someone based on where they're located, which aids in personalization on a website, then right out of the gate, uh, there's a concern there. So is there a blanket statement that anyone should be including, say, in the footer of the entire website that explains, you know, we may track where you're from in order to provide you personalized content. What, what can we do about that? So the, there's really no easy answer to this question. Um, the definition of personal data under the GDPR states that personal data is any information relating to a natural person, such as an identification number, location data, uh, physical, physiological, genetic traits, social identity traits, cultural traits, et cetera. So it's a very wide-ranging definition. So that even encompasses IP addresses. Now, because the definition of personal data is triggered when somebody is coming to your website, the question is, what do we do to um, get explicit consent when they come to the website? What a lot of people have done within the European Union, and you may have seen this, and there's really an interesting secondary market of things like WordPress plugins that help compliance in this, in this manner, but... Um, Every time a new IP address comes to a website, you will see a little pop-up that says, um, you know, we're collecting personal or personally identifiable information from you. Do you agree? That's what we're typically advising clients to do, except we're telling them that that, consent, that request for consent needs to be even more explicit than it hasn't been in the past. Again, it needs to be uh, using clear and plain language, can't be hidden, and they, now there's a requirement that the consent needs to be tracked. So if consent is given, then there needs to be tracking that consent was given that is tied to that specific IP address to show uh, in a compliance audit that um, consent was freely and voluntarily given. So there, there's a lot of um, additional nuances to what has been done in the past that, again, is going to make compliance a little bit more difficult. Out of curiosity here, is your advice that you would be doing that out of the gate before you even looked at the IP address or only if it's, um, if it's a European IP address? I would be doing it only if it's a European. Well, I'm going to do it either way. And the reason why our firm is going to undertake these practices is simply because we believe that this is the way that the world is going. Um, in light of these recent incidences, such as the Cambridge Analytica scandal, um, mm -hmm. I suspect that we will see a similar data protection law within the United States. Uh, obviously, we have a different um, social structure than the European Union does, and I think our data protection policy will tend towards more, um, more of creating economic activity instead of controlling it via regulation. So I think we'll have a looser policy, but as far as best practices are concerned, I think um, following the EU as a best practice will at the very least protect us for what's coming down the road. Now, we're a different case because we have to practice what we preach. <laughs> for U.S. companies, right. I would try to segment, segment my audience because if I was a business owner, 
I would be concerned that the competitive uh, cost associated with these extra regulations um, would would impact my bottom line. So uh, if, if there's a if there's a way for a business to segment that traffic in a way that makes sense and a, a way that um, doesn't increase compliance costs, I would say that would be the way that I would handle it. Well, not only that, but I can only imagine um, avid online shoppers would be pretty frustrated if every time they went to a website. <laughs> um, but is it – so with that consent, though – would that be just for that one session, or would it be because this person has already understood this or already agreed to this? They're good to go at that point. Is that correct? Yeah. So if the – again, it depends on what the the request for consent states. But my perspective mm-hmm. on it is you, if you were going to undertake this as a – you know, you're going to say we're going to comply, I would make the choice to say that we're going to collect your IP address so that we know that you've given consent on previous occasions. Um, so, I, I mean, it would be almost impossible. I guess it's not impossible, but it's a, it's a huge burden to have to get a qu- unequivocal consent, record it, and do it during every session. Um, so I, I don't know what the answer is right now, but I, as of right now, my perspective on, on the way that I'm reading the GDPR is that um, you can write – a request for consent with a scope that's broad enough that will allow for multi-session access to a site while still complying with the GDPR. So what are the actual penalties? Have they listed any penalties in that? So the penalties are huge. And part of the reason that they are huge and part of the reason why the GDPR is such a big deal now as opposed to back in 1995 when the EU created the Data Protection Directive is because no one really took it seriously. So the current penalties are uh, up to 20 million euro penalty or 4% of the company's annual global re- revenue, whichever is more. So, wow. so it's a massive stick by which the EU can hit you <laughs> with. Um, for a single the, occurrence? It, for a single occurrence, now the GDPR has a proportionality clause within it. So the actual penalties that are assessed and the enforceability of the penalty is difficult to estimate because it is based on a fact determination. So there is a set of criteria that a data protection authority will identify when um, when determining what penalty should be assessed against a company that is not compliant. Outside of enforcement by data protection authorities, which are really um, – the, the country authorities, there are also private remedies. So, for example, if a user believes that their personal data has been used inappropriately, then that user can sue within the European Union the, da- the uh, company that has collected and misused that data. If that user sues, the user is entitled to damages as well. Um, so that you can be either hit by the regulatory agencies or you can be hit by the user. Now, a lot of people are asking us, well, I'm a U.S. company. Why should I care about this? They're never going to enforce against me. And while I understand the perspective and, you know, kind of the, (laughs) for lack of a better word, cowboy mentality, um, the European Union is taking this very seriously, and I think we will see wide-scale enforcement against U.S. companies that are collecting information from EU residents. There's a couple ways that this could play out. One is that, obviously, if you have a company that is located within the European Union, there's going to be jurisdiction over you, and a data protection authority can then uh, make your life miserable if you do not comply. The second is that if you have revenue or uh, payment accounts or any other assets located within the European Union, a data protection authority could then arguably seize your assets or levy upon those assets for the purposes of satisfying a GDPR judgment. In cases uh, that might be applicable to e-commerce owners, companies like PayPal uh, and Amazon have places within, for example, Luxembourg that uh, store money on behalf of, of their users. So this is a real issue for companies even located in the United States that are utilizing those services. And then 
there's this really other interesting problem that we're looking at, which is that in order to comply with the GDPR, a lot of companies have signed up for this uh, thing called the Privacy Shield, which is through the U.S. Department of Commerce and basically allows um, for self-certification for the cross-border transfer of data. So, for example, if you're a U.S. company and you're receiving data from Europe, uh, you can opt into the privacy, uh, to the Privacy Shield to transfer that data. Well, that contains an arbitration clause. So if you sign up to comply for the GDPR, you may actually be subjecting yourself to an arbitration clause that allows people in Europe to sue you and start an arbitration proceeding against your U.S. company. So there's all these, you know, we're hearing, well, what are they going to do to me? Well, the answer is they are probably going to be able to do a lot to you, and that's why we're telling people to take this very seriously. Wow, that's very eye-opening. <laughs> um, okay, so right now, this is coming up in just the next couple of weeks. I'm a small business owner who has done nothing. I mean, I got those emails from Google. I got them from Constant Contact. I just kind of filed them away thinking, oh, I'm set, I'm set. Is there anything last minute I could do right now to – basically better secure my business uh, once this goes into effect? Is there anything I can do that's a, a, a quick fix, even if it's kind of a Band-Aid fix, before I really get serious about taking the right steps? Yeah, I think a, a Band-Aid fix and a quick fix is probably start looking at your internal policies and make sure that you are at least getting in the right direction. So when I say internal policies, I would say things like, how are you collecting data? How are you storing it? Are you storing it for the limited purpose of uh, why you've requested it, or are you using it for other purposes? Document your contracts with your vendors. So if you are sending data to a third-party vendor, for example, uh, for the purposes of email marketing, make sure your contract provides for protection of data um, with that during that transfer. These are simple things that people can, can do themselves now before we start to see enforcement of GDPR. Now, if you're a small business and you're saying, you know, I only make $500,000 a year in revenue, how am I going to comply with this? I think the answer is let's see how it plays out. And the reason why I think that is the answer is because you're probably not the, the chief target. It's The EU is already looking at companies like Facebook. Um, they're looking at Amazon. And this is really a means by which they can start to rein in some of the abuses that they've seen from those companies. So the likelihood of a, a smaller U.S. e-commerce store becoming um, a, a problem or, or becoming uh, an immediate target of the GDPR regulation authorities is fairly low. Now, I don't want to say that's great legal advice because if you are making more money and you're directly targeting European residents, Compliance really isn't that hard. It's just it's going to take a, a little bit of time. And so what we're advising larger companies that are operating in this space is to have somebody analyze your current data collection and use policies, and then we've created a set of form contracts to kind of aid uh, our clients to really comply with these regulations and to implement best practices as we see how this develops. So... You know, attorneys are made to make you scared. <laughs> that's, that's our, our <laughs> chief job. Uh, and that's not what I'm trying to do, but this is something that should be taken seriously. And even if you cannot comply now, these are things that you should start thinking about very seriously within your business so that as we go down uh, the line and this becomes a more serious issue, you have at least taken some steps to substantial compliance um, for the future. So back to that Facebook thing, if I use one of Facebook's embed tools for the like boxes or comments or whatever on my website, who would ultimately be responsible for that? Is it me? Is it Facebook? Or is it both? So there, the GDPR provides two definitions of people who fall under the scope. One is a data controller and one is a data processor. A data controller is an entity or a person who determines the purposes and means of processing personal data. A data processor is the entity that processes that personal data on behalf of the controller. 
So if Facebook is processing data on behalf of your direction as a data controller, then you can be held jointly and severally liable so that you can be basically equally as responsible for any potential issues as Facebook is. And that's a, that's a pretty big problem because uh, joint and several liability means that you would have to go after Facebook if you ultimately were um, found liable under the GDPR. So basically, if I, have an, if I have a website where instead of using its own commenting system, if I'm using Facebook for my commenting system on my website, that could be a problem. That's absolutely right. It could be a problem. And that's one of the chief reasons why we are telling clients, take a look at who your vendors are, make a list, and then find out what their contracts say so that you can ensure that there is upstream compliance, so that if you are using some service provided by a vendor and they are representing that they are compliant, um, there is some contractual provision that ensures that they are actually compliant. So that would mean these social media networks like Facebook, Instagram, you know, any of these that let you embed certain content or have people interact with those networks through your website, even though you're not paying them, they're vendors. Yeah, and that's a real problem because absolutely. And one of the things that we're running into is uh, Amazon AWS is one of our vendors. And the idea mm -hmm. that somehow we're going to negotiate or, or uh, fight with Amazon over GDPR compliance to ensure that uh, we get a, a provision inserted into our contract with Amazon is, is absurd because Amazon is going to tell us, well, we'll just move on to the next, the next user. And that's a real problem because if you are a, a company that takes compliance seriously, then those types of things really need to happen. But if you have disproportionate bargaining power, it makes them more difficult to happen. So in those cases, we're telling clients, just document everything that you've done. Make sure you can, to the extent possible, push that liability upstream. Um, but it's a, it's a conceptual and a business problem that really – will probably play out over the next two to three years, and it will be interesting to see how it does. Are there any, is there any business insurance or related policies that will help small business owners cover any potential claims? Are business insurance companies even looking at adding this into policies? Yeah, I mean, insurance companies, will, if there is a way to insure you for something, insurance policies will always exist, uh, and the premium will reflect <laughs> the risk associated with the insurance policy. <laughs> So there are certainly insurance policies out there that will cover GDPR compliance. It's going to be more of a question of um, what does it cost. I, I've not seen a, a very reasonably priced uh, GDPR liability um, rider yet, but I'm sure there's probably one out there now. I would certainly look into cyber insurance for this purpose, and there are some really great vendors out there now that um, – are, are working in this space that might be able to provide more information on that than I can. But as far as I'm concerned, and I've done kind of self-insurance before for larger companies, there's got to be somebody out there who will insure for these types of liabilities. Well, of course there are. <laughs> yeah. It just it depends on how much you want to pay. <laughs> I just remember back when the uh, merchant account providers – started charging all those additional fees and requiring all this additional testing for the PADSS. And it just, it, it got so cumbersome and, and sometimes very expensive for the small mom and pop. You know, it's, it is, it's interesting to see what's going to happen uh, in this respect. Yeah, it really is. And I hope that we can work it out in a way that doesn't hurt um, business because obviously Europe, as regulatory as they are, also has an interest in ensuring that they have robust economies, um, Germany especially leading the way on that. And so I think we'll see some kind of middle ground. I think as of right now, we don't know what this is going to look like. But as we start to move forward and as we see kind of how the regulatory bodies are going to deal with this regulatory issue, um, I, I don't think this will be as, as big of a deal as – we believe it is, but at the same time, I also don't believe that it's something that um, you should not take seriously. Thanks for that, John. Is there anything else that you would like to add? I don't think so. I think the only thing that I would add is simply that 
Um, this is something that's going to be also addressed in the United States eventually. So now if you're, if you're going to comply and you're going to take this seriously, now is really the time to start thinking about it. And it's better to prepare now than it is to um, solve a compliance issue after it's occurred. So to the extent that you are in a, a business position to attempt to comply, um, certainly you're going, going to want to do that. Awesome. John, I really appreciate your time. I know you're very, very busy. No problem at all. I'm happy to do it. Okay. Well, I've been visiting with John Giacomo. John is a partner with Revision Legal, a leading internet law firm. The website is revisionlegal.com. That's revisionlegal.com. John, thank you so much once more for your time. <laughs>